to our second preview show of the week where BBC Radio Solent's Chris Temple is virtually alongside me as we look ahead to Sunday's game at Vitality Stadium. Here's what's coming up. We'll start back at Wednesday night and that defeat at the Etihad before moving on to the weekend and that game against Southampton. Well, let's start back in the week and that game against Manchester City. Chris, it, it wasn't quite the result that we wanted, but what a fight, what determination from, from the Cherries. Yeah, it was everything but the result, wasn't it? I mean, it, unfortunately, at this stage of the season, good performances don't keep you in the Premier League. You've got, you've got to get something for those performances. But, I mean, I don't think anybody expected Bournemouth, even with the recent resurgence and, and starting to get things turning in the right direction, I don't really think anybody would have you know, rightfully expected Bournemouth to go there and cause City that many problems. Yes, you might get a, a few chances um, because, you know, City focus might be elsewhere and they changed a few players. So you're thinking, OK, well, if you get a couple of good chances, you've got to try and take one. 14 shots and that it was a great stat that someone came up with after the game that's the most shots any team has had at City since Pep Guardiola took over which is a great feather in Bournemouth's cap of course it counts for absolutely nothing unfortunately in the, in the fight to stay in the Premier League because you don't get points for you know sort of little uh, little markers like that but they were so close to getting something I think they'll be kicking themselves they haven't um, because I don't think they'll get a bit better opportunity to get something off City than that Obviously, he rotated a few players. City, when Sterling came on at the start of the second half, he thought, well, again, that's probably a mark of respect to Bournemouth that City aren't happy. Pep's not happy with how it's going. Sterling didn't really yet one or two little flurries, but he certainly didn't affect the game in the way that he has before because Bournemouth were on the front foot for quite a lot of it. Um, and City were penned back. Uh, I thought the, the rotations that Eddie Howe made in the team selection before the game were sensible, um, putting in some fresh legs and also saving some legs for, for Sunday as well. He seemed to make the subs at the right time. Callum Wilson and David Brooks came on and had a, a superb impact, obviously, linking up for the goal. Callum should have scored. He should have scored at least one. Uh, probably the right-footed shot that sort of bounced its way past the post. He'll be looking out on his stronger foot and thinking that needs to go in. Um, there's other couple of blocks in there. Harry Wilson had a shot blocked, didn't he, as well? Dom Solanke in the first half. Uh, the, the, you know, the millimetres offside, Joshua King. Uh, so, you know, so many little moments that you look back on and think, oh, it could have been. But... Saying all of that, um, again, it's, if you can't win, then take as many positives as you can because it wasn't the last game of the season. It wasn't, you know, do or die. Um, it has, once again, a bit like Leicester, been a bit of a springboard, hopefully, for these last two games. And um, City scored so early on. I think it was the fifth minute and, you know, you're thinking, oh, you know, not, not the perfect start, not, not what Eddie Howe would have wanted. But as you say, they didn't sit back. They had 14 shots, the most of any away team at the Etihad under Guardiola. And they also limited City to... I think the fewest shots at the Etihad under Guardiola. So even if the result wasn't there, Eddie Howe would be pleased with those stats going forward. And you have to look at those City goals and say they're two moments of magic. I mean, it's a brilliant free kick from David Silva. I mean, Ramsdale's not having a lot of luck at the moment because people keep knocking uh, free kicks into the top bin. Uh, that one grazed off the underside of the bar. He didn't have much of a chance with it, but so early on in the game as well, um, you're thinking, oh, here we go again, I'm sure. Cherry's fans were thinking. And then, of course, the mindset for probably for those outside becomes damage limitation immediately when you can see it after five minutes. And most people before the game were saying, would like to come away with a 2 0 defeat. That'd be great um, in terms of goal difference and how important that could be. Jesus, you know, that came from nothing, a little, a little step over, and suddenly he's put it in the corner. And that before half time is, you know, a long way back uh, for the Cherries there to be two behind. But to be fair, came out, you know, firing in the second half. Obviously, unfortunately, didn't manage to get the goal till it was probably just a little bit too late. But again, even that goal in defeat from David Brooks, we see how tight the goal difference is now. That could well be crucial. And in terms of fine margins, we saw Junior Stanislas' free kick. Edison superbly saved it onto the post. If that rebounds back off his head, it goes in. If it goes anywhere, someone can get a rebound. And then Joshua King in the second half up the other end of the pitch, that offside decision, it could not have been any closer, could it? Yeah, I mean, the free kick was a great save from Edison. I mean, uh, you're right, if, it, if the luck's completely turned, I mean, it has turned a little bit, but if it's completely turned, then yes, Joshua King is two millimetres onside instead of off, and that does go in off the back of Edison's head into the net rather than bobbling past the post. So, yeah, two two moments that just fell on the wrong side, and Bournemouth have had a few of those this season. I mean, just, you know, looking back at a couple of weeks to the Joshua King, um, you know, handling the ball into the net against Spurs, which would have been the winner. So there's been a couple of moments that could have been decisive, and who knows, as you say, if, if those uh, goals go in at that point in the game, um, how much different things have been. It may well have spurred City into action, who knows. But, um, you know, the fact they opted not to bring De Bruyne on was probably quite helpful to, to Bournemouth's cause as well. But, yeah, all in all, to package it up, I think 
they'll be kicking themselves they haven't got anything from it but it was as good as it could have been in defeat talking of Joshua King's handball a couple of weeks ago there was one uh, there was one on Wednesday night David Silva it looked like the ball hit his hand in the box what was your view on that one well, I divided a bit of opinion on Twitter with this one because I didn't see it at the time, really. I didn't really see a replay at the time. There were some appeals from Bournemouth players. And, of course, everyone says, oh, VAR didn't check it. Well, they check everything. They're watching everything as the game goes on. What they didn't do was stop the game and think it needs to be given some further detailed examination or, you know, heaven behold, the ref goes over and looks at the monitor. Um, I saw, The first I saw of it really in detail was a grainy clip that someone um, sent me on Twitter. Uh, and I, I still think it's debatable. Uh, one of the Cherries analysts sent me, a, sent me a different angle from behind the goal where it, it looks a little bit more um, like it should be a penalty. My argument would be that David Silva, yes, his arm's up. It's close, to the, it's close to his shoulder, somewhere like this. But he's expecting the guys in front of him to head the ball. Phil Billing, I think, was one of them. I can't remember who the other one was. They jump and miss it. He's only a couple of yards behind them. He's sort of got his hand up, preempting the ball, maybe coming over or flicking off them. I think his hand's already there. I don't think he's moved it towards the ball. And if anything, I think the ball hits him if it doesn't hit his hand. And it didn't, fall, it didn't impede a Cherries player because there were City's players behind. So my personal view was I can see why they didn't look at it any further. I can also see why on the basis of some of the other ones that have been given this season, we go back to Adam Smith at Burnley and a couple of other ones, that maybe you know, the standards are varying. But for me, I think it probably erred on the side of not being a penalty. But I know people will be, most of the replies I've had think I'm talking nonsense, which is what people think most of the time anyway. <laughs> And just finally on, on City, always going to be a tough ask to go there. The game's now out of the way. They can focus on, again, we'll come on to it in a minute, but a really big game this weekend and, and the last two games of the season now. Yeah, of course. And when you see City on your fixed list and you've, you've gone to United and you've seen five go into your net and goal difference could be a factor, um, then, yeah, you're, you're looking and thinking, well, I mean, it's going to be hard to get anything, but the one thing you don't want to do is take a panning because confidence-wise, it could knock the spirit out of you. It'll have a bad effect on the goal difference column as well. So I think, yeah, from that point of view, it goes down as a good day at the office as, as best it can be when you lose a game. I mean, it sounds preposterous as ever to say it's great to lose a game because Eddie won't have seen it like that. He'll, be, you know, he'll have been kicking himself if they didn't get something from it. So, yes, plenty of positives to take. But, of course, go back to what I said right at the start. Unfortunately, positives don't keep you in the Premier League points do. Points certainly do and next up where the Cherries will be trying to get three points this back game on Sunday against Southampton. Eddie has been previewing that one in his pre-match press conference. Um, Adam Smith uh, will make a late decision in, uh, on he's felt better. Um, Chris Mepperman, Charlie Daniels, Simon Francis, uh, as I said Nathan will probably all be out. Our last two home games have been very good. So you look back at the Tottenham game and I think it's very much approached the game in the same, the same manner. That's both tactically and um, physically and mentally. Um, been really, really pleased with our, with our last two home performances. That got us four points. And we know Southampton have got a lot of time for, for what they've done this season. It's been an incredible turnaround. I tried to rotate the team as much as we can while keeping the strength of the team. The most impressive thing I think about, about Danny is, of course, he's a an outstanding player technically he's very good plays with re real intelligence the way he's come back from his his disappointments you know the injury setbacks he's had the way that he's fought back and kept his mental strength has been hugely impressive confidence levels have definitely shifted upwards um as we've gone on through lockdown i've got no idea what what it will take all we can do is try and win our two games um and hope that that's good enough well that was eddie howe speaking on friday morning in his pre-match press conference now, Chris, before we talk too much about that Southampton game on Sunday, West Ham played Watford. They've, uh, they've got themselves a 3-1 win. Talk us through the situation now. Great result for Bournemouth. Brilliant. I mean, the best result would have been West Ham adding a few more and not conceding, of course. But if you'd have offered Cherries fans a 3-1 West Ham win before that game on Friday night, absolutely. West Ham had to win it from Bournemouth's point of view. Dented the Watford goal difference to some extent now that it's only two goals uh, difference between the two, as well as the three points, of course, in the points column. So, yes, uh, I've got to admit, once Watford scored that goal early in the second half, I was uh, getting a little bit on edge that they were starting to, to dominate the game and could well come back to get something. But thankfully, West Ham managed to, to stabilise things a little bit. So that was a huge result for, for Bournemouth. I think, you know, looking, I mean, Watford in the first half were dreadful. So you're just hoping now that they've got those two very tough games, City at home on Tuesday night um, and Arsenal, of course, away on the last game of the season. And that result means now, and the, the difference means that Bournemouth could win one of the last two games. And we said this 
last week when we were looking ahead to what might happen in the West Ham Watford game. Bournemouth could win one of the last two games and stay up. They could afford to lose one of the last two games now, I think, if Watford, of course, lose both of theirs. Um, because the goal difference now, if Bournemouth win a game and Watford lose a game, the goal difference is going to swing one the other way, isn't it? Um, it's going to be cancelled out. So, yeah, to, in a nutshell, that West Ham Watford game went pretty much perfectly for the Cherries. And it's a huge opportunity now for Eddie Howe and his side to go out on Sunday, make a statement. If they can get the win, it puts the pressure on Watford. And as you say, it's that Manchester City game next that, as we've seen, is not easy for anyone. Well, the carrot there now is that by you can pretty much almost get it back in your own hands, can't you? Because if you win on Sunday, albeit West, uh, Watford will still have a game to play, but um, Bournemouth could climb out of the bottom three with a two-goal win over Southampton. Again, easier said than done. Southampton have been playing brilliantly, particularly away from home. But a two-goal win over Southampton on Sunday would see Bournemouth climb out of the bottom three because they've scored more goals than Watford. And, of course, goal difference, the next divider is goals scored. So, Cherries are ahead in that regard, and that's probably unlikely to swing in Watford's favour that particular column. So, if it really does get tight, Bournemouth have the edge on that one. So, yeah, it's a huge motivation for the Cherries to say, right, let's actually get ourselves out of the bottom three. We've been in there since Christmas when they had that wretched run, of course, themselves went to West Ham. I think of that game that, that started this year, New Year's Day 2020 at the London Stadium. A dreadful 4-0 defeat. And you think of now that they're in the fight still. Um, West Ham have obviously been a bit up and down since then as well. So, yeah, this is a, a big motivation. I think it'll be a great game because Southampton, they certainly won't want a double done over them. Bournemouth haven't done a double over Southampton in the league um, and obviously played them off the park earlier in the season at, uh, at St Mary's. Um, Saints got back in the game with a penalty, of course, and then... Uh, a little bit of a catastrophe at the end. Saw Callum Wilson roll it into the net to send the away fans into jubilation. Uh, no such fans to give it a bit of a, a local neighbourhood edge, if you like, this time. So I guess for Bournemouth, I'm not sure how much it will feel like a, a local derby. And I know that phrase you know, divides people as well. Because as a, as a home team, you're turning up to your home ground. There's nothing about it, apart from a bit of familiarity with some of the opposition players, that makes it a derby, really. For Southampton, getting on the coach and travelling half an hour, that probably makes it a derby for them. And that will wake them up to the fact that it's a local game. But it's just, it's the next game for Bournemouth. It is a tough one. Um, I'd rather be playing Southampton than Manchester City and needing to get something out of the game. Let's put it that way. I'd rather have Bournemouth's fixtures than Watford's. But Saints have been very good away from home. They're nearly on a record-breaking points total away from home. And of course, this lad called Danny Ings, who, I mean, there's a story to be written, isn't there? Unfor I mean, there is, if you're looking from a, a sort of Southampton perspective or a, a romantic perspective, that Danny Ings, the man who Eddie Howe, not saved from the scrappy, but certainly when he was a youth teamer and had a, a bad injury time, uh, and Eddie Howe was manager, he gave him a professional contract, gave him his debut at the age of 17 against Northampton in the EFL Trophy way back in 2009, then took him to Burnley, of course, for a million pounds, had a bit of faith in him when people at Burnley were probably saying, you know, what about this Ings lad? We haven't seen too much of him at Bournemouth. Um, and here he is, maybe playing a, a role in possibly dumping his old club out of the Premier League. He's had a great season. Great to see him have a run of games where he's been fit as well because he's had such bad luck with injuries. Uh, he's a great lad. He's popular with Bournemouth with fans still, I'm sure, um, because of you know he is a homegrown talent that's gone on to be great. So, yeah, um, I'm just hoping he doesn't have too big a role to play on Sunday. Uh, as you say, Southampton, their form has been superb since the restart. You know, that, that win over Man City at home and then obviously going to Old Trafford and getting that last-minute equaliser, they've been... They've been in some serious form, haven't they? Yeah, it's taken them a while. I mean, Ralph, Ralph Hasenhutl, to be fair, is probably benefiting now, and Eddie said this in his press conference, that you know, he's probably benefiting now from the fact he has settled in a bit and he's managed to instil his ways of working because Southampton have turned over so many managers in the last you know, six or seven years um, that you know everyone comes in with their own style. I know they like to play the Southampton way. I'm using my magic inverted commas again, but uh, the Southampton way, which they have this little black book, which has everything in it, apparently. But Arsene Hüttel's done things a bit differently. His team work really, really hard. Um, and that's going to be the one thing Bournemouth will have to overcome is the work rate of the organisation that, that Southampton have. Not in the same way as, you know, Palace and Wolves and Newcastle, that it's you know not the most attractive football. They don't sit with just a, two lines of four because, you know, Danny Ings gets a lot of service. Um, and they do break quickly. So it's going to be two good teams. Southampton, as I say, will want to want to not sit back and uh, just roll over for Bournemouth. They want to um, get some local pride back, I'm sure, and, and finish on a high and a couple of million pounds per place in the Premier League as well. So if they can nudge themselves up a place, I'm sure they'd be pretty happy with that. But yeah, it's, it's not, as, not as easy a game as maybe people would look at mid-table and think, oh, Southampton in mid-table. Because since lockdown, as you say, apart from that Arsenal defeat, 
a great draw at Man United, a win over City, a couple of other really good away performances. They tonk Norwich, they tonk Watford away. So yeah, it's going to be uh, it's going to be tough. But I think with the way Bournemouth have been bubbling up in the last three or four games, I think they should definitely go into it with confidence. And in terms of Bournemouth injury news, Eddie Howe said this morning Nathan Ake won't make it. There's a chance for next week, but he won't he won't make it for the Southampton game. And Adam Smith are going to have to make a late call, and obviously still suffering from concussion from that Spurs game. So. Again, just like last week, plenty of options available to him. Yeah, I wouldn't change the back four. I'd keep Jack Stacey in, even if Adam Smith is, is fighting fit. Hasn't had a great post-lockdown, Adam Smith. Uh, I think Jack Stacey's done nothing wrong in the face of... Yeah, yeah, he's had a couple of moments. Of course, he's been up against world-class opposition. It's his first season in the Premier League. So there'll be moments. But I think his energy up and down will be crucial in a game like this uh, because it may well swing end-to-end. Uh, I think certainly the, the work rate is going to be the key. So I would have Stacey in, definitely. I'd definitely have Stanislas in. Um, on the left-hand side. I think he's been rotated carefully in the last couple of games. Brooks, I'm sure, will come back in because even in that little, I can't remember how long he played, maybe 20, 25 minutes at, at City, I mean, he looked he looked a threat as well. So, again, one who's just been chipping away more and more minutes and seems to be getting a bit of that rustiness out of his system. Of course, the season's going to end too early for him, probably, um, just as he's getting back going, although there may be a quick turnaround into the new season. So, hopefully, he can retain that, whichever division Bournemouth are in if he stays. But yeah, Brooks in, Stanislas in, Callum Wilson in, which does provide a headache up front because Dom Solanke's been excellent the last two games as well. Um, I just wonder if Joshua King might be the one squeezed out because I think you have Callum Wilson in your team if he's fit and 100%. And I think that's the reason he was left out the other day is to save him for this game uh, and to have some fresh legs up top for that Man City game. So I wouldn't be surprised if Joshua King got squeezed out and he went Solanke and Callum Wilson for this game. Well, we'll have to wait and see. It is a huge game at Five County Stadium on Sunday and Chris will be there with Willow and you can listen to live free commentary on AFCB TV. We'll be back next week to preview that final game of the season against Everton.